Hey, great. Oh, let me. So, are you ready? I am. Okay. <laughs> if you're ready, I am ready. Okay. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Robin Steiber. Welcome to the National Quiz Rise Online News, same part uh, of the great column for the hype fans around the world, that is. And here I have uh, Mr. Main, who himself has wrote this book called Search Inside Yourself, now available all worldwide, even as ebook as well. And um, Mr. Main, tell us, you know, what is your inspiration behind this book? I mean, how do you come about, you know, finding uh, you know, the inspiration you know, even to make it a evangelistic, uh, you know, worldwide phenomenon, mm -hmm. in meditation class? Right. Uh, embarrassingly enough, it started uh, because I wanted to create the conditions for world peace. Yeah. So I was taking a walk, uh, and here's, here's the rough idea. The idea is that uh, in in Google we have twenty percent time, yeah, so twenty percent our time we can spend on whatever project we wanted to do, and I decided to spend my time working on creating the conditions for world peace. Because if I could solve any problems I wanted, I might as well solve the hardest problem I know. And so I went through a couple of months of figuring this out. But eventually I figured out that the way to create the conditions for world peace is to create the conditions for inner peace, inner happiness and compassion on a global scale in a way that helps people succeed and in a way that helps business interests. So, yes, so so I ended up creating a curriculum for search for emotional intelligence called Search Inside Yourself and then the book is derived from the curriculum. Uh, now, speaking about the, the curriculum itself, yes. you know, um, when did you see the need and the change of your perspective of your life you know, uh, and the need to search in areas like meditation? Uh, was this, uh, was, was this a, the, Know, gone as far as the day you start uh, with Google or, or more? Uh, it went, went all the way back, even before that. I think it was uh, the, my first year in university, which was an NTU. Uh, I attended a talk by a Tibetan nun, and I remember one sentence in the middle of a talk, which is, it's all about cultivating the mind. And that one sentence to me was life changing. I figured out that every, everything in my life makes sense at the moment and it's all here, here and here, like mind and heart. So I uh, sort of, in the next couple of years after that, I learned meditation and I realized that in meditation, I could change me. And the most profound change in me was I found my happiness set point moving drastically. So before I learned meditation, if nothing good happens in my life, I was unhappy. And then fast forward to many years later, if nothing bad happens, I was very happy. Drastic change. Really? Yeah. So, so that was the motivating factor. So found finding the, the causes of inner happiness myself and then because of that, creating the desire to want to help the rest of the world access to that. Now, how often do you meditate? You know, uh, do, you, do you usually prescribe to anyone to, uh, by the same methods that you have performed on yourself? Mm -hmm. oh, definitely. Uh, at least 30 minutes a day. But, uh, so 30 minutes of formal sitting. Uh, sitting down and doing whatever I had to do. Uh, but also uh, informal practices. So for example, when walking from place to place, bring full attention to the process of walking. So that's mindfulness of walking. When speaking to somebody, paying full attention to the process of listening. And also uh, something called heart practices, which is for example meeting a human being and thinking I want this person to be happy. So, so do you do that before uh, the start of your day at work or, or do you have a, some kind of schedule? Yes, uh, so I do formal sitting uh, at the end of the day. Um, so first, first few minutes of the day and the last half hour of my day and 
and in between I do the informal practice. Oh, okay. Now, your, your path to tranquility, you know, I wrote this book as a guide to attain inner peace and, and anger-free life. <laughs> if, 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 if you could correct me if I'm wrong, you know, it, it's really about anger-free life. Not entirely anger-free, but uh, really? skillfulness with anger. Oh, okay. So, now, could you share with us the, you know, the, the, uh, the practical benefits you know, of developing uh, our spiritual potential as well as physical, uh, you know, and how, tr how true is it for you, and, and how and does it really improve, you know, uh, uh, you know from, from, you know, from, from the way that you know, we, we learn the steps that you're given to us? Mm. Uh, these practices are so beneficial that, in my opinion, this could be the most important thing you learn in your life. Really? Yes. Well, you don't even have to take it from me, right? Uh, William James, the father of modern psychology, he says the ability to bring your attention back over and over again is the basis of judgment, character, and will. And he calls it excellent, uh, uh, education par excellence. So to the father of modern psychology, that one thing alone is the most important thing to learn in life. But I think, I think it's even beyond that. So let me give you an analogy. <coughs> analogy is uh, physical wellness. So if you are physically fit and healthy, uh, from an external perspective, you look as if you are. It's a look as if it's a neutral state because yeah, you're free from physical affliction. Usually, yeah, however, the first person experience of that that state is very positive right? because you're healthy and fit. You, your first person feeling is I feel great about myself. I feel great at everything I do. Right. Uh, this is true for the inner life as well. If you have, if you engage in inner mental and emotional training, you get the same amount of wellness. The, the wellness in emotional and, and the mental state. But the effect is even more profound than physical wellness. So you, you get access to happiness and peace and compassion. So it's life changing. But what kind of benefits do you, do you actually feel you derive from, from these practices? The first benefit, I think the most immediate one, uh, is happiness. Right, so as I talked about earlier, like moving the set point of happiness. Yes. So, so I've reached a point in my life where at rest, right? Nothing, nothing else is happening. I'm just resting. I'm happy. And I think that that alone justifies everything. If you have that one skill alone, you will always have a sustainable attitude. But beyond beyond that, beyond being happy, I also realize that uh, I've learned the ability to work with people better. Kindness and compassion, social skills. And those are valuable as well. Amazing. Now, how important is the soul? I mean, you developed this book uh, about meditation, you know, uh, you know, such insight yourself. That's right. Um, you mentioned about the soul as well. Is, is, hmm. uh, is that, is that played a very important part for a human being? Not the soul, but spirituality. Yes. Uh, that's an important difference. So what is spirituality? There are two aspects of spirituality. The first aspect is seeking within. Because within is the, the fountain of all good. And this quote did not come from me. This quote came from Marcus Aurelius, which is a Roman emperor. It's not even a Buddhist, but an emperor in Rome figured this out. So that's aspect number one. However, as you continue looking deep within yourself, you find something ironic happen. You find that you are able to go beyond self. And then spirituality goes from being about maximizing this to forgetting me and serving the greater good. So it goes to service. And so spirituality is not about the soul. It's not just about the soul, it's about service. Now, as we meditate every day, yes. for, for most of us, you know, why do bad things happen to us even though we've done nothing wrong? You know? Mm. I mean, you said mm. you spoke about inner peace you know, right. and so forth, right? but yet you know, bad things still happen to us 
you know, is that part of karma or, is it, you know, or uh, how do we how do we resolve that? You know, mm. and also mm. it's supposed to also help us to calm us. It was supposed to right. tame our anger. Right. You know, uh, right. so right. so tell us, you know, uh, if we screw up some somehow in life, you know, like you know, we have a very bad temper with, with our colleagues and so on. You know, uh, is is that is the, has that become a waste of our time? Uh, you know, really, you know, meditating through the steps of life. Such as inside yourself, mm -hmm. or is there a way that we that we could redeem ourselves? Mm. Uh, so speaking as an engineer, I can only say bad things happen to us uh, by chance, randomly. Okay. <laughs> because I, I don't actually I don't have any data, compelling data to suggest that it's because of past karma. I think bad things happen to everybody, randomly or otherwise. However, I think what's important is not what happens to us is how we deal with it. And very often, if we have the skill to deal with difficulty, then we can have a good life, irregardless of what happens to us. And I think the people who have the, the sharpest insight into this are the Tibetans. They, for example, for them, they say difficulty is not a distraction from your practice. Difficulty is the practice. Right. So, one way to look at it is this. Uh, if, you see, if you're walking along a path, and if you see barriers, right, if you see a wall, what's important is not that the wall exists. What is important is you have a skill to climb over it. And the more skillful, if you're very, very skillful, you just climb over like nothing. So a barrier seems like nothing to you. Right? And then they say, okay, bigger barrier, a mountain, in between you and the destination then maybe treat the mountain as what you can do to improve your skill. Like by climbing through the mountain, you become a better climber. So the next barrier you encounter, easy. I can just easily climb through it. So it's about skillfulness of how you encounter barriers in life. Okay. Now, how does one know if they're making progress in moving up the spiritual ladder? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, as, we, as we perform meditation, how does one know, mm -hmm. know that, that, that they're making progress? Mm -hmm. There are a couple of uh, uh, pretty, fairly obvious markers. Uh, one of them is how peaceful my mind is at rest. Uh, am, I, am I scattered? Or, or in the words of St. Benedict, is my mind collected? Because of the collected mind, which is different from the, the opposite of the scattered mind. So, so that's one dimension, uh, the dimension of, of scatteredness of mind. Another dimension is the, the intensity of what we call afflictive emotions. So intensity, if I'm feeling greedy, like how, how intense is that? If you find intensity lowering over time, then there's a marker of progress. Uh, also things like you will. Like if I feel angry at people, I'm jealous of people all the time. Like, but now I feel less jealous, like that's lowering intensity. So that's progress. Uh, and a third one, a third measure which is very useful is the speed of recovery. So for example, anger. If I'm feeling angry, how fast does it take for me to recover from the anger? And the mark of, of mastery is you recover from it in the moment it arises. And there's a, there's a very beautiful phrase, uh, analogy. And the beautiful, beautiful analogy is like writing on water. The moment it's written, it disappears. So the moment anger is written in the mind, it disappears. No. Interesting. Yes. Now, someone once asked me uh, on my email. They said that one of my readers asked, "Why my, why has my life has become more difficult since I started my quest for spiritual improvement?" <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, they meditate and then right. the, you know, life has been, been you know, not really improved, but it's been more difficult. Could you, you know, able to explain? Maybe. So this is a very interesting phenomenon, which uh, at first we were very surprised by. So the phenomenon is this, if you start, if you measure people's meditation, like you get a group of people, you measure the, how distracted their mind is over time. So what do you expect? You expect that they are, they'll be less distracted after they practice meditation. Right? So they did this experiment and they, the surprise was that people, rest, they say they're even more, rest, even more distracted after they learn to meditate, which is surprising. And then later on, they discovered what was happening. So the first research was done with first-person reports. People reporting how distracted they are. 
and subsequent research were done by uh, other other means like, like brain brain uh, brain measurements and so on. And they discovered that as you learn to meditate, your you actually your brain is actually less distracted distractible. However, you notice your distraction more than before. So the first person experience is that I'm feeling more distracted. And that could explain why it seems more difficult. Because there are a lot of things that we didn't notice before if you were stepping on a spiritual path, especially if you begin meditation. A lot of things that were hidden to you before become obvious. And then you find, oh my gosh, my life has so many issues. I never noticed. My mind is so, so distracted. I never noticed. So that's why it seems worse. The good news is that that's only the beginning. So if you can see it, you can change it. So seeing it is the first step. So you see it, you see it, it's really bad. But it's okay, because once you can see it, eventually you can change it, and then it can come down. And then everything will be better. Okay. There's another question, also from one of my readers. It says, is great good? How do you balance between doing what is right and just and compete at the expense of others? Where do we draw the line? Is this world peace? I mean, what is peace? You know, I mean, because this guy who right. meditates daily, you know, right. he, he has to, you know, he has to compete with his colleagues and so on. You know. mm -hmm. And so he felt right. guilty about, uh, you know, being greedy. Right. So the question is, is it is it good? Is this what's good? Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, yeah. mm. is it good to, to, to be greedy? Okay. You know, and mm. compete at the same time right, right. while well, well, yeah, no, still staying religious? Okay. Uh, the, the one word answer to the question is skillfulness. But let me explain what that means. I think this was from the book, I don't remember which one. Uh, it could be the seven habits. And there are three levels of, of skillfulness. The first is dependent, right? you're dependent on other people. Not very skillful. And beyond that, what is more skillful than dependence is independence. You're, you're independent of people, then you're skillful. You can be more successful. Right? However, there's a level beyond that, which is even more skillful than independence, which is interdependence. Which is that you are fully independent, you can function by yourself, and yet you want to work with other people, you do it successfully, and you can be even more successful than you if you were alone. Like skillfulness. So in this case, for example, I think competing with people, doing a zero-sum game, right? competing at the expense of other people, is a valid strategy, but it's not skillful. The skillful strategy is to, is to do it in a way where everybody wins. You help people succeed, and at the same time, you succeed. And if you do that, then people want to work with you. They love you, and you've done the right thing, and you win. And everybody wins. Now, in the search inside yourself, yes. you know, many ask, where do we go from here? You know, I mean, after reading this book, you know, and most of us, most of us are inspired and practicing. You know, what's next? Hmm. What is next? Um, I have, I have an idea. Uh, it may not be the right idea. Uh, I think that what is next is to create aspirations for greater good, for compassion. So just inspire, I mean, aspire to save the world, but don't actually do it. Don't, don't actually do anything. Just do whatever comes most naturally to you. Why? Because if your aspiration is strong and your compassion is strong, whatever is the most natural thing to do is also the right thing. It's also the most compassionate thing. So therefore, you ended up you end up saving the world without doing anything extra, You're just doing what's natural. Yeah, and and a, a very good example. Uh, I I know a few examples. One of them is uh, is this person called uh, Roshi Joan Halifax. Uh, she spent her life serving the dying, and to her, it's just the most natural thing to do. I mean, she even she doesn't even think of it as sacrifice. She's just doing what she wants to do. And her path is just increasing her compassion and just do what, what's natural. Well, and Mr. Meng, you know, could you also, you know, um, before we end, okay. uh, we'd like to know, you know your, the secret of your success. You know? <laughs> I mean, uh, could you give, you know, at least three points for you know, aspiring authors and speak like yourself, you know? The secret of my success. Yes. You know, 
Okay. I can tell you the secret of my success in one word. Luck. <laughs> I am successful because I'm lucky. However, I can tell you how I'm lucky and how you and you can be lucky. Uh, I'm lucky in two ways. First is I'm always in the right place at the right time. And second, I always be people want I mean I'm always surrounded by very good people whose success contribute to my success. And that's why I'm successful. It's just it's just my luck. Right? But then how are you how can you be lucky? It turns out it's not entirely passive. There are things you can do to be lucky. So the first step is to prepare to be lucky. Right? So to do that, for example, always do your best job. And always try to grow. Even if you're stuck in a crappy job, if you always do your best, uh, when a, a position opens up and they need to promote somebody in the position, they will go like, oh, that guy is always doing the best job. He's always outstanding. Maybe he's the guy. Right? So the opportunity opens up, you're the, you're the guy there. And then if you're always growing, you're always creating the opportunity for your own success when it comes. So that's the first step, uh, preparation, uh, by working hard, doing your best. The second thing is creating courage for change. A lot of times, we opportunity arise, but we don't take opportunity. Why? Because it's scary. It's scary because you know what, if I if I do that, uh, like for example, going to America for me, going to America, I I sacrifice my career. I mean, I have a job here, well paying. My family is here. I'm familiar with everything. I go there. I start from scratch. I'm a student. I pay fees. I have no income. Right? And then I go, I go to a place where people hardly understand what I'm saying. Does it not scratch? Very, very scary. So I have the courage to change, to grow. Again, the growth mindset is important. Why did I go to America? To grow. So, so courage. The third thing is to have a, a very good idea of what you want out of life. And the way to, do, to approach that is to figure out what are my values. Now, if you know your values, then you know what you want. And then when the opportunity comes, you grab it. But to other people, they say, hey, how come you're always so lucky? Yeah? How come you always get the right opportunities? But it turns out, everybody else has the same opportunities, especially with the same team. But you are the one who grab it because you know what you want. So you're lucky. So this is being the right place at the right time. Uh, the other half of it, being surrounded by people who are successful or great people, is the other half of the practice, which is what we just talked about. Always wanting to help people to, to succeed. Always wanting other people to be happy in a way that also helps me. And that is how I surround myself with very amazing people. And all I do is just be lazy. Well, thank you, Bing, for being on our show. And here he is. Please do look out for his book, Search Inside Yourself, by Robin Steinberg. And say hi. Thank you. Thank you. How was it?